this is the microphone. Uh, uh, this thing is Azure. It's my first time using this thing. All right. Our next speaker is Yuan Chin from uh, yeah. uh, from uh, Yale, you're going to tell us about yeah. uh, Okay, thank you very much for having me here to give this talk. And uh, my name is Yuan Xin. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So I'm currently at Yale University, and um, I'll join um, uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, this fall um, and work with uh, uh, Greg uh, uh, Polsky and. Uh, yeah, so today I'll share with you uh, this fun little project uh, uh, in computational, uh, numerical computation. And uh, the idea is that, um, yeah, so we want to calculate the macroscopic phase of matter from uh, like the microscopic description of, uh, of a theory. And uh, we know that RG flow is deterministic, but in order to extract any information in the IR from this like purely, the information in the UV uh, by doing a first principle calculation, if the theory is strongly coupled, is still quite non trivial. And uh, recently, in the last decades, we have like uh, uh, many success in uh, bootstrap, like uh, conformal bootstrap and S matrix bootstrap, which gave us a, a lot of uh, like of these uh, success, successful extraction of the IR um, data from just purely looking at the self-consistency in the IR. So say we start with from any theory and uh, it flows to a CFT by looking at the self-consistency in the CFT, we can extract the data from it by just looking at it. But uh, for our purpose in the confinement collaboration, we want to actually do um, a slightly different job. So we want to start with uh, some theory with some UV description and uh, and we would like to see like, okay, so what does the RG flow lead to us? Whether the theory is, so say that we define some lattice gauge theory and in the IR is it gapped or is it, uh, uh, is it CFT or is it something else? So uh, we look for a method that can basically give us this kind of like, uh, so we will look for a bootstrap method that can like use uh, systematically use the UV information and also use the self-consistency. Uh, and hopefully we can rigorously extract some information about the IR of the theory. And uh, okay, so to see how it works. So we currently have, I think uh, like a version of the, the, this, uh, this method that's working in say quantum mechanical system and lattice system. And uh, like easy example of like how this works is uh, by looking at say like the unharmonic oscillator. So we just start with uh, zero plus one D quantum mechanics with this Hamiltonian. And uh, so if we remove the interaction term, this is just a simple harmonic oscillator. But if we add this like quartic coupling, then a lot of things become very complicated. It's very difficult to get analytic results, um, but we can still, extract very, so so the authors here found an interesting way to extract rigorous bounds on say the uh, uh, eigenvalues and expectation values of uh, these methods, even though it's strongly coupled. Um, so what they did is that they consider this thing called the, the Hankel matrix. So say that we start with some unknown um, eigen, uh, <coughs> eigenstate, and uh, and we have like operators like uh, x to like one i plus j, and then we just make a matrix out of like uh, the x i plus j uh, moments um, on top of this uh, <coughs> uh, this eigenstate, and uh, this matrix. So the unitarity requires uh, this matrix to be positive semi-definite. You can think of like, you can dot this uh, matrix from the row and the column, some vector. And what you get is the norm square of some, some, some state and it has to be positive. And 
by requiring this thing to be positive semi-definite and also like requiring say like the equation of motion driven by uh, commuting the Hamiltonian with uh, like any operator here we have like x to any power or just like inserting the Hamiltonian into this matrix element. And we will uh, acquire a equation of motion that relates different moments. And if you put this into this Hankel matrix, we can fix almost everything in this matrix up to two numbers, the energy eigenvalue E, which we don't know, and X squared matrix elements. And then it just becomes a yes and no question. We just plug in these values. Immediately we get some numerical matrix up to some like cutoff K. And it, since it has to be positive, we can just ask, does it have a negative eigenvalues or not? If, okay, so well, is it positive semi definite? If yes, then that means an eigenstate with these data is possible. And if no, then we can rule out this uh, combination of uh, um, this, uh, uh, yeah, the combination of the, <coughs> these data. And we can just make a plot, right? So we can choose different cutoff. Like cutoff just changes the number of uh, uh, constraints you're considering. So it, at each K is still rigorous. So just, and you can see as we consider more and more constraints, we get a smaller and smaller island of the energy eigenvalue and the possible uh, expectation value of X squared. And this way we can get a pretty, we can get a rigorous bound on the data of uh, the unharmonic oscillator just purely from the description of the Hamiltonian. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, this is zoomed in to the first uh, eigenvalue. So you can get series of islands. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's pinned down to like 1%, basically. K is this uh, dimension of this Hankel matrix. It's the maximum power that you consider. Uh, yeah, max power of X. Yeah. Uh, no, it just, yeah, I just want to make a plot that's still visible. Yeah. <laughs> Well, actually, it's A. Yeah, so it's their work. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, yeah, so I didn't show a plot, but uh, you get like an island which is slightly larger than this one for E2. And then, yeah, then on and on. Yeah, at some point, we don't have enough resolution, it becomes kind of a peninsula. Yeah. Yeah, so, and then uh, basically out of this, uh, uh, this method that I just explained, um, people in the community in the past uh, a number of years have, been, have done uh, uh, many different pioneering works and many of these works are done by the audience or like people in this collaboration. And we have Anderson and Kutensky uh, and also follow up by uh, Kazakov and Zheng uh, in bootstrapping the lattice yang Mills theory. Uh, in I think uh, two and three and four dimensions. So there they consider like uh, the Wilson loop operators expectation values and the equation of motion are the loop equations of yang Mills. And using these, they can say like put a bound on say like the expectation value of any Wilson loops. And here I'm showing this uh, like expectation values of uh, one plug head in the lattice yang Mills uh, as a function of uh, the um, the Yang Mills coupling. So I'll leave the fun part to uh, yeah to to Martin's uh, talk in this afternoon. So here I'm showing that uh, this work exists, and uh, also like uh, so the group of uh, Cho Gabai. By the way, Gabai Ga Ga is also our audience, right? So and Lin Rodriguez, Sander, and Yin. Uh, last year considered the bootstrapping the easing model, I think in 2D and 3D. So yeah, here they consider like expectation value of some insertion of uh, spins in say like some region in the, in the space time. And uh, uh, the equation of motion they use is a discrete, yeah, it's the discrete version of Schwinger Dyson equation from like just varying the spins in the, in the action, in, in the easing action. And then they got bound on say like some correlation function of some like nearby or ne next nearby uh, spins. 
uh, yeah, so there is a critical point. So I think at this point you get uh, easing. So if there's no magnetic field, yeah. And then of course, like near the critical point, uh, we have like a very long uh, correlation length. So the bound becomes worse. That's usually the case. Yeah. Yeah, and here it comes my work. Hopefully I have enough time to finish this. So we consider, okay, so if we move on from like a finite dimension degree of freedom system to an infinite degree of freedom system, say like a one plus one speed dimensional spin chain, then like, can we ask this question? Like, can we get the gap out of this infinite system? Um, in this previous work, people considered uh, the like for the infinite system, people usually consider the energy density because if you ask like what kind of equation of motion are still there that's finite, this commutator like of Hamiltonian with any operator is still, is still there. But if you insert Hamiltonian into the matrix element and try to get the energy eigenvalue itself, then this blows up. So it's much easier to get the energy density measure than the like energy eigenvalue individually or the gap uh, to be measured in the infinite system. And uh, this is precisely because uh, so far, I think mostly we've considered the diagonal matrix element taking the bra and cat to be the same. And uh, yeah, energy density just disappears in this measurement of those matrix elements. And what about off diagonal matrix element? That's our main contribution um, in our work. And we consider, in our work, we consider the self consistency uh, from, say, like the diagonal matrix elements of, say, like some. Okay, so here I'm using again the unharmonic, unharmonic oscillator as an example. So some operator acting on the vacuum or the, the ground state. And it has to be related to like this infinite sum of like in intermediate states between like any pair of operators acting on the Brian cat. So we insert a complete uh, spectrum. And, uh, and this kind of gives us like something looks like a crossing symmetry. Uh, if people are in, uh, if people are familiar with uh, um, uh, conformal bootstrap, this is almost like the, crossing symmetry in conformal bootstrap. So we have like some operators, we can have, we can, we can fuse the operators first and then we act them on the states where we can fuse that operator to a state and get even a sum of states. And these two things after you sum over all the states have to be, uh, have to be equivalent. And out of this equation, uh, we use the equation of motion to limit down the possible, uh, possible object that they can appear in this equation. And it turns out that we can write on everything in terms of like a, a quadratic sum rule. So we have some matrix element, some off diagonal matrix elements square, uh, multiplying some unknown factors, some over like, okay, so these are some over different sectors. Here is this parity all sector. We can have like parity even sector in the unharmonic oscillator. But schematically, we just get a sum rule in terms of like square of a matrix element multiplying norm square of matrix element multiplying some un, some some sorry some known factor in terms of like the energy and uh, okay in terms of the energy eigenvalue and uh, uh, actually just the energy eigenvalue of uh, the ground state and also the exchange state in the that we insert in the middle. And the idea is since this thing is positive, or if we have a multiple matrix element, then the matrix elements, uh, then this thing will form a uh, positive semi definite matrix. The factors multiplying it, if we can rearrange a whole bunch of these crossing equations to make, to find like a vector alpha such that alpha dot into this prefact this area of prefactors give you something positive for all of the energies that can go in this exchange. If that's true, then that means like if you insert, if you dot alpha into this, then you have the left hand side zero and the right hand side something positive times something positive, and it's always positive. So basically that just rules out the, uh, the spectrum. So then how it works is like, 
you say you start with uh, the Hamiltonian and you say, assume that the theory has a gap, uh, all of the energy eigenvalues has to be either E0 or something greater or equal to E1. And then you show that like you can rearrange this equation such that it's, uh, it's all positive for, uh, for anything greater than E1, and then you rule out the spectrum. So this way we can put an upper bound on the gap. And then you can also consider more uh, systematic, uh, yeah, we can consider different type of these uh, equations. And uh, uh, my claim is that we can also put lower bounds on the gap. By considering like a number of these like uh, different crossing equations, but yeah, the key is that we can now we actually can measure the gap. Okay, so the results we tried. Okay, so we also tried this on the zero plus one uh, dimensional uh, quantum mechanics, and here we use the same k defined as before the maximum power of x, and uh, we see like using the same k we can drastically improve the uh, the precision of the bound. So previously you have like a 1% and using basically the same kind of data or slightly more because we're introducing a whole bunch of off the matrix element. But at k is equal to eight, we have like eight digits. So this is like the power of uh, inserting or power of using the, uh, the information of the off the matrix elements in the same quantum mechanical bootstrap. And we can also like from our bound, uh, there's also a way for us to extract an approximation of all the excited uh, eigenvalue, uh, all the eigenvalue of all the excited, or a whole bunch of eigenstates uh, of, uh, of the excite, uh, excited states. And uh, as we crank up K, these kind of things also improve. Yeah. And uh, we want to, uh, yeah, we also studied the uh, one plus one dimensional transfer field easing model. And the Hamiltonian is this following. So we have the nearby uh, coupling of sigma Z and some magnetic field in the sigma X direction. And we have a coupling H. And so transfer field easing model is very simple and people have uh, uh, analytic solution to it. And basically if we measure the gap, it's expected to have like, a two-fold degeneracy, which means if you measure E1 minus zero, uh, E0, zero, you get zero for H smaller than one, and it goes linear, and, the, and uh, the degeneracy is lifted as you take like H greater than one. And this is a theoretical value. And uh, we considered this uh, Hamiltonian, and we took a bunch of operators, uh, some local operators or some, bi uh, some, some nearby, uh, some bi-local nearby, insertion of sigma. So we take these operators as seeds and we construct our basis of operators using like Hamiltonian commuting with it. And we do it on the, okay, so I'll finish in a second. Yeah. So uh, we, we commute the Hamiltonian with it uh, like a number of times and so we get like a, a number of operators and we get a number of crossing equations and using that, we can put an upper bound on the gap. And that upper bound in the gap improves as we take more and more crossing equations. Yeah, so now uh, let's conclude. So as a proof of principle, the self-consistency of the theory plus some UV information gives us a bound on the gap without any approximation, period. Uh, but beyond this, we, so first one can ask like, what is the efficiency of the current bootstrap? I'll say this is not very much. So we spent like hours in computing these bounds, but actually if you just like uh, take a, a direct diagonalization of L is equal to 10, this basically is much better than any of the bounds we obtained before. But I want to say that uh, the efficiency depends a lot on the basis of operators that we use. And since we don't have any intuition at the time we're doing this project, we just like show some local operators and it seems that uh, it does not convert very well. Uh, but I wanna mention that these authors recently uh, have also looked at say transfer field easing model and uh, models in the one plus one D spin chain. And they were able to like get, get uh, like a bound on the energy density at the like 
at the level of DMRG efficiency. So there's a lot of hope. So by choosing a different, basically choosing a different basis, we can achieve a lot of precision. And what about lower bound on the gap? And this thing, so, it, so we have a lot of these uh, questions, uh, the similar kind of questions in conformal bootstrap. And the way is that to turn on, to get the lower bound on the gap, we usually need to look at the mix, uh, Operate a mixed correlator bootstrap. And here the analogy is that we don't look at, just look at the operators acting in the vacuum, but we'll also look at the mixed like vacuum of first excitation. And we introduce a whole bunch of other crossing equations that, get, that gives us the lower bound. And higher dimension, I'll just say there's no change in the key technology. So we just like, uh, yeah, we, we can just straightforward, straightforwardly try it on 3D. And uh, of course it needs more work because we have to do a lot of, uh, we have to deal with a lot of more uh, operators. We have to like, we have uh, like rotation symmetries that we have to take into account all of these, but it's doable. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, there is uh, essentially no change in the, uh, yeah, in the technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the idea is like no matter what shows up in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, insertion of uh, identity, it all contributes something positive to the crossing equation. So you don't do the. I don't. Yeah. So, so the idea is like, no matter what shows up in the middle, it all, yeah, it's all considered, it's all uh, bounded basically, yeah. Yeah, so we just, we have these factors. These factors come from uh, say like uh, uh, commuting the, so, so these, these factors come from the applying the equation of motions. And these are completely known in terms of EK. And e zero, so so basically this is this is going to be a polynomial of e k, and we have a whole bunch of these crossing equations from like a different operators inserting here, and each equation is independent. We can just do a linear combination of them, and we do such a linear combination of them parameterized by alpha such that it's positive for all e k, right? It's uh, trying to prove a uh, this thing dot by alpha is a sum over square of polynomial of the UK. And then you're done. Everything that can show up in the middle give you something positive in the right-hand side. Yeah. Uh, what's that? Uh, can we do what, sorry? Uh, uh, I think essentially, okay, so I don't know how well does it, uh, it the bound will be, but uh, like essentially the technology does not depend on translation invariance. Uh, sorry, is that true? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, currently this, uh, this model depends on, uh, this method depends a lot on locality. So when you commute the Hamiltonian with some operator, we better not generate a whole sum of operators to infinity, which we cannot control. But uh, if there's no translation invariance, I think it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's still, it's in, in principle, all of this is still true, but I just don't know how to make it finite. Yeah.
Okay, so the smarter basis, I'll go to like their work. So this is introducing somebody else's work. We haven't done this, but we found this thing to be like very learnable. So what they did is that they, on this uh, one plus one uh, spin chain, uh, they use this uh, set of a, a constraint of requiring the reduced density, density matrix of like any number of size has to be positive, ha has to be positive seven definite. And then the lower number of size reduced density matrix has to be the same as if you take a partial trace of uh, the higher number of uh, uh, size reduced density matrix. This is using the locality and uh, and uh, well, basically the structure of the Hubert space and also translation invariance. And uh, then you just require, okay, so these, these uh, constraints are obeyed up to like say N size. But up to here, it's still like positivity and, and also like tracing larger one, you get a smaller one. But up to here is still like th this problem scales like exponentially as uh, the number of sites. And the smart, uh, smart thing is that they actually considered not the positivity of not the reduced density matrix itself, but the reduced density matrix contracted with some, uh, some NZATs they got from DMRG. And once they do that, they got like basically, they got uh, a finite dimensional matrix for any number of uh, sites. And they, then they can go to a very large number of sites. And the, the mir miracle is that the ones that they say they consider a like very large number of sites, and they try to re uh, minimize the energy density that obeys this, all of these bounds that I mentioned uh, uh, just now, they get uh, the lower bound on the energy density that is uh, as accurate as the DMRG results, or at least as, um, as good as those. Yeah. So the kind of lesson that we learn is, okay, so we can also consider a whole bunch of operators like strings of sigmas, and then we construct by, contracted by some ansatz of like a tensor products, you know, like matrix product states and stuff like that. Maybe we can also get a good balance, yeah. Memory gap. Okay, so this may have been a, a well. Okay, so 